home nothing. I'd like to try this thing just once. Come on, honey. We'll show them a thing or three. No one will agree completely with my ranking. All opinions are valid. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It would be great if, in the comments, you post your ranking 1 to 10, 1 being the best, and I will compile the viewer's choices. The criteria is based on the overall movie. This is a quick run-through of my ranking, 10 to 1. In the complete Fred and Ginger playlist, there are detailed reviews and ranking explanations of all 10 movies. And, after that, series of clips that will take you through each movie in detail. A link is at the end of this video. There is no specific criteria. In my opinion, Top Hat was their best musical, Swing Time their most passionate, Roberta their funniest, The Barclays of Broadway their most touching. Some had the best songs, others the best dances. I also consider Fred, and even more Ginger, great actors, so special scenes count also. In the end, they were making movies, the overall product. That is what my rankings are based upon. The nominees are Flying Down to Rio, 1933, The Gay Divorcee, 1934, Roberta, 1935, Top Hat, also 1935, Follow the Fleet, 1936. Swing Time, also 1936. Shall We Dance, 1937. Carefree, 1938. The Story of Vernon and Irene Castle, 1939. And Their Reunion Ten Years Later, The Barclays of Broadway, 1949. Flying down to Rio is two almost diametrically opposed things. On the one hand, it is a very important movie history event, launching the greatest song and dance team in movie history, which changed how dance scenes were choreographed for the classical musical era. And it launched the careers of two of the classic era's greatest stars. On the other, it is, regretfully, not a very good movie, the only Fred and Ginger movie that is not overall at least good, if not great. It is for this latter reason it is rated last. In an interview later in life, lead actor Gene Raymond said he thought the movie was going to be the bomb of all bombs. The performance by the leads was underwhelming. I have not seen Raymond or the beautiful Dolores Del Rio in other movies, and of course the script and direction could be major factors. Only twice were Fred and Ginger not the leads in their movies, and both times they stole the show. It is no surprise no star volunteered to be the lead over them for the third time. All of this was driven by one dance scene, the karaoke. For fans familiar with their dances, it is nice, but not really exceptional compared to their total body of work. 2020 hindsight distorts historical views. In 1933, nobody had done something this special. So special, posters for the movie were created highlighting the fourth and fifth build performers. Fred surely thought the quickly put together dance was nothing special compared to what he had done with Adele. So he was stunned when Douglas Fairbanks Jr. said to him, What do you mean by revolutionizing the movie industry? I've just seen Flying Down to Rio and you've got something absolutely new. It's terrific. Important? Yes. A great movie? No. 
Ginger gets a cute opening scene and then a naughty little song in a skimpy outfit in their only pre-code movie. For the first time, movie audiences are dazzled with the fast-paced Fred Solo, and he sings a song that hit number six on the Billboard Top 100. Ginger appears in a crazy airplane scene. This is their only movie with no romantic involvement between Fred and Ginger. They are friends and bandmates. Ginger had the higher billing, but Fred plays the lead sidekick, so has many more lines, and we are introduced to his charming ways. What makes this movie distinctive is one little Fred and Ginger dance scene. So new and different, they applauded in the theaters and the line at Radio City Music Hall wrapped around the block. Flying Down to Rio was not a hit, but the karaoke was. At the top of the poster for the next movie, it proclaims the king and queen of karaoke. The story of Vernon and Irene Castle is the outlier in the series because it is only a Fred and Ginger movie because Fred and Ginger are in it. Otherwise, it has nothing in common with the other nine movies. In its time, it must have been a wonderful, nostalgic movie, but modern viewers cannot share that nostalgia. These are the reasons I rank it so low. That does not mean it is not a good movie. It is very good. It is a documentary movie about an outstanding couple and their amazing lives. It allows both Fred and, even more, Ginger to prove they could do dramatic acting, at times outstandingly. When it came out, it must have been wonderfully nostalgic for the audience. A period piece about the songs and dances from 25 years before. A happy time compared to the Depression and then World War II. Now, precious few are still alive from that time. Constricted by its biographical nature, Fred had to choreograph within the dance styles of that time. So the famous dance scenes need to take a step back from before Fred and Busby Berkeley, before the Black Bottom and the Charleston. It is interesting to see these dance styles, to hear the music. Many classics I, being up in my years myself, recognize. There are plenty of song and dance scenes. Ginger recreated the famous Yama Yama Man routine. Fred shows off for Ginger tap dancing to By the Light of the Silvery Moon. My second favorite dance in the movie is the Texas Tommy to Waiting for the Robert E. Lee. The dance that made them famous, the Castle Walk, is charming. They do a nice but tame tango. They barely do the foxtrot and then rush through the polka. The Maxix is nice, but I do not think it ever caught on. Fred does a comedic song and dance scene to Hello, Hello, Who's Your Lady Friend? Louis Mercier performs Darktown Strutter's Ball with a Jean Sablon voiceover. It has one new song, written by the famous team of Herman Ruby and Bert Kalmar, Only When You're In My Arms, who wrote many songs back then. The movie needed a hit song. And while it is nice, it was not a hit. This is the only movie they made without a happy ending. For the first of only two times, Fred and Ginger are a married couple. And for the second of two times, the plot is not Fred chasing after Ginger in some fashion. The early courting scenes are nice, and we get a little bit of the Fred and Ginger we had come to expect. Their early career struggles are also interesting. They do have some special moments, some of that famous chemistry, here and there. The movie rushes through their successes as quickly as they can, while still explaining the amazing display of self-promotion by the castles. What the castles accomplished is truly astounding. Then the movie becomes sad, because of course it is sad when your husband goes off to war. This leads to the best scene in the movie, their last dance together. Ginger shines in this dramatic, broken-hearted scene leading up to the dance, and then Fred's choreography is at its best in a somber, gorgeous dance. In Fred's bio, he talks about the great influence the Castles had on his developing dancing style. He and Adele went to see the Castles multiple times in several of their Broadway shows, including attending The Sunshine Girl nine times in 1913 when he was 14, and Watch Your Step with Irving Berlin's first score. One thing I really do not get, 
in a movie about the castles going over their career, there is so much they skip, including the only movie they ever did together, The World of Life, 1915. This is the choice that is going to be disagreed with the most, especially from Gershwin fans. The Gershwins were not at fault. They provided two great songs and several other nice ones. Before the movie, some considered them having gone too highbrow in their previous work, especially with Porgy and Bess. George Gershwin sent a telegram saying, Rumors about highbrow music? Ridiculous. I'm out to write hits. And the Gershwins delivered. Songs, even great songs, while a crucial component of a musical movie, do not make the movie alone. I have many issues with their seventh movie, Shall We Dance, which I cover in depth in my Fred and Ginger series of documentaries. I will leave all this for the documentary, because I call this list rated from great to the greatest, and there's plenty I do like about this movie. Just not enough to rank it over the others. The Gershwins, They Can't Take That Away From Me, is, to me, the second most beautiful song and the most touching in the series. The song, Let's Call the Whole Thing Off, is very special, very clever. The dance to it on roller skates is truly unique. I like Ginger singing, They All Laughed, and the dance, after a slow start, gets very good. On board, Fred does a song and dance with the rhythm of the machines to slap that bass. There are some laughs and some nice moments. A variation on the Fred Chases Ginger plot. This time Fred never really screws up. It is others doing all they can to destroy their romance. Fred sees Ginger in a flip book and wants to marry her. Ginger is frustrated with men constantly pawing at her. She is a bit of a prima donna, tired of fame and fortune, and threatens to quit, as her manager says, again. She will return to America and marry a rich man. Fred hears this outside her door and introduces himself with an over-the-top Russian impersonation. Afterwards, he hears she is taking a cruise to America and follows. He walks dogs to get near Ginger, and it works, and he sings about their love in beginner's luck. Now the interference starts three parties with their own agendas, including both their managers. Horton had told Fred's ex-dancing partner, Galleon, Fred is secretly married. She leaks it to the gossip columns, and now it's in the ship's bulletin. Fred demands Horton straighten it out, but he tells Ginger it's all Fred's fault. Ginger takes off, literally. <clears throat> Ginger's manager, Jerome Cowan, traps her into doing a dance with Fred to They All Laughed, in front of her fiancé. As always, Ginger loves dancing with Fred and is all smiles afterwards. When that doesn't work, Cowan photographs a sleeping Fred with the Ginger mannequin and leaks it to the press. The image is on the front pages of the newspapers. To make matters worse for Ginger, Fred rushes over to her hotel room and when her fiancé comes in, Fred comes walking out of her bedroom wearing a robe. They hide from the press in Central Park, where they do the great song and dance scene on roller skates to Let's Call the Whole Thing Off. Ginger callously declares they should get married so they can get divorced. On the ferry ride back after getting married, Fred pleads with Ginger with the very beautiful They Can't Take That Away From Me, and Ginger hides how miserable she now is with her divorce idea. Back at their hotel, Fred decides to play hard to get, and they both hesitate at the door between their suites. At the worst moment Fred's ex-dancing partner visits, Ginger comes through the door, and she runs away again. The managers combine their two shows, and Fred dances to They Can't Take That Away From Me with ballerina Harriet Hochter. She also does an amazing and disturbing display of spinal flexibility. Ginger comes to the show, determined to finally deliver her divorce summons to Fred. Fred sings and then dances to Shall We Dance, and so misses Ginger the dancers are wearing Ginger masks. Ginger is so moved, she sneaks into the ensemble, and when Fred finds her, they dance and live happily ever after. 
In their series, Ginger had higher billing than Fred, at least partially, in the first two movies, Flying Down to Rio and The Gay Divorcee, because she was the far more established movie star. If Ginger was to have higher billing in two movies based upon her contribution, it should have been Roberta and Carefree, because only in these two did they fully utilize Ginger's comedic skills, never more than in Carefree. Carefree was the shortest movie of them all, at 83 minutes, with the least amount of song and dance scenes, at four. It had many of the components of other Fred and Ginger movies, a few very nice song and dance scenes, some good dramatic acting, the supporting cast adding some laughter. Unlike their other movies, this time Ginger chases Fred, at least at first, until, well, you'll see. Unlike anything they had ever done before, and, for that matter, unlike almost anything Ginger did in her long career, Ginger literally rampages through three over-the-top comedic scenes, and these are the highlights of the movie. The 16th-month gap between releasing Shall We Dance and Carefree was their longest between movies. It received mixed reviews, some very positive. The song Change Partners was nominated Oscar Best Song and hit number one on the Billboard Top 100. This was the last song by Fred to hit the top 10. The Am Dance is number 50 on the drive-in Top 100 movie dances. Its gross revenue seems fine at over $1.7 million, but RKO claimed a $68,000 loss. Bellamy goes to Fred, his good friend and psychiatrist, for help because his fiancée, Ginger, has once again called off their engagement. Ginger agrees to a session, but while waiting, accidentally hears the insulting predictions Fred recorded about her. Angry, she gives Fred a hard time and storms out. Bellamy invites Fred to the club. As he is practicing on the driving range, Ginger appears and flusters him. Fred shows off with a combination dancing and golfing routine to Since They Turned Loch Lomond Into Swing. When he finishes, Fred looks up triumphantly towards Ginger, but she is gone, obviously duly impressed. Fred and Ginger make peace over a bike ride. For dinner, Ginger eats dream-inducing foods suggested by Fred, rather stomach-turning combinations that leave everyone nauseous except Ginger. Ginger dreams about Fred. Fred sings, I used to be colorblind, to Ginger, and then they dance to it. Most of the dance is shown in slow motion, and it is very effective. Then, the kiss. Up to this point, they never held each other passionately, nor kissed, and it was getting ridiculous. Fred finally agreed, and the short kiss seems very long in slow motion. Over breakfast, Ginger tells Gear, her aunt, she is in love with the man she dreamed about. The next session, Ginger cannot tell Fred about her dream. He insists, so she makes up one ridiculous whopper of a dream. The deeper she buries herself in this story, making it up as she goes along, the more frantic she gets in the telling until she is a victim to a wild pack of vicious squirrels. Fred is thrilled, thinks he has a textbook case of a tragically disturbed woman. She has everything wrong with her. Now starts the second, and to me the best, comedic sequence. Fred sedates Ginger to talk to her unconscious mind, telling her to do whatever she wants. She tries to kiss Fred. Fred leaves Ginger to rest. Bellamy wakes Ginger up to get to her job. Ginger kisses him, calling him Fred, and then makes a face, saying, Get away, Steve. Totally stoned and without inhibition, Ginger is a horror show of nasty little childish pranks. Bellamy gets her in a cab, but she goes out the other side and starts following a glass company truck, trying to find something to throw at it. Finally, she borrows an officer's baton, smashes the glass, and runs away. At her job, she is a mess, cannot follow the script, and insults the advertiser and his product on the air. Fred and Bellamy drag her out of there, make excuses to the policeman whose baton she borrowed. So she kicks the officer in his backside. Lucky for Ginger, their friend, Kolb, a judge, 
handles the case. At dinner that evening, Ginger tells Gear she loves Fred. Ginger asks Fred for the first dance, and when he refuses, beans the judge with the roll, demanding she get her way. But the song ends immediately. Ginger sings the yam for the audience. I do not like this song, but Ginger does as good as can be done singing it. She asks Fred to dance. He refuses, so she threatens him with the full plate this time. He relents. This is a nice fun dance, as they lead the crowd around the building. It is best known for Fred launching Ginger over a series of tables around the room, a huge smile on her face. But I prefer the part on the side of the building. It is Drive-In's number 50 Top 100 Movie Dance. Ginger tries to tell Bellamy she loves Fred, but he instead assumes the wedding is back on. Ginger tells Fred she loves him. At the next session, Fred tells Ginger it is common for patients to mistake trust for love, and Ginger cries. Fred hypnotizes Ginger, putting in her head she loves Bellamy and Fred should be shot down like a dog. Fred steps away and argues with himself, realizing he loves Ginger. But Ginger has already left, off on her next comedic rampage. She recklessly drives to the club. She meets up with Bellamy and Kolb skeet shooting and shoots the judge's target, and then his hat. Fred arrives, and Ginger chases after him, terrorizing the entire place, trying to shoot him down like a dog until Fred snaps her out of it. Waiting for the judge, Bellamy tells Fred he and Ginger are getting married tomorrow. Fred tells Bellamy he needs to hypnotize Ginger to remove these thoughts he put into her brain, and that he loves Ginger, and Ginger loves him. Furious, Bellamy gets the judge to issue an order of protection against Fred. Fred comes to the engagement party anyway, but Ginger wants no part of him. He sings the Oscar-nominated Change Partners to Ginger, as she dances with Bellamy. Carson distracts Bellamy with a prank phone call so Fred can be alone with Ginger. He puts her into a trance and they perform a beautiful romantic dance to change partners. Ginger is totally under Fred's control, moving as he commands, making for some beautiful, if a little creepy, imagery. Before Fred can take those ideas out of her head, Bellamy and the judge arrive. It's wedding time, and Fred is running out of time. Fred has to knock out Ginger, but he cannot bring himself to do it. Bellamy charges in, swings at Fred, and misses, and knocks Ginger out cold. Carson and Gear hold Bellamy down while Fred does his magic. The judge is knocked off his feet when Ginger comes out with Fred and a big black eye, and they live happily ever after. With the huge success of Top Hat, and swing time already in the making, the studio rushed out Follow the Fleet to capitalize on their popularity. Originally planned as a follow-up with the Roberta cast, Irene Dunn was unavailable, and they really could not put Fred and Ginger as supporting cast anyway, so it had a rushed rewrite, and Harriet Hilliard, later Nelson, replaced Irene Dunn. It is a nice movie, but pales in comparison to the other two. In many ways, Follow the Fleet was a refreshing change. Fred and Ginger are not the idle rich, luxuriating in opulent, faraway settings. Fred is a sailor, Ginger is a performer in a little club, and for the first time the story is in America, San Francisco to be specific. Like in Roberta, Fred and Ginger are reunited lovers, and this time Ginger starts right off showering Fred with love. Until he screws up, of course and then screws up again. Some things never change. But in two scenes, little Fred is gallant, heroic. You really gotta love him for that. There are several nice song and dance scenes. The highlight of the movie is their first somber, beautiful ballroom dance, Let's Face the Music and Dance, to end the movie. The movie starts off on a Navy ship with Fred singing a funny little song, We Saw the Sea about the monotony of a sailor's life. At their lockers, his friend Scott sees a picture of Fred and Ginger's dancing act, and we find out Fred proposed to Ginger, and she rejected him. 
At a dime a dance joint, Fred runs to a phone right away to find Ginger. Nelson meets Scott, but he blows her off because of her appearance. Nelson is Ginger's sister, and we see Ginger also cherishes pictures of Fred. Ginger gets Lucille Ball to dress Nelson up. Ginger performs the catchy Let Yourself Go with Betty Grable in the chorus. Fred and Ginger are reunited. Ginger is so adorable in this scene, teary-eyed with joy. Scott sees Nelson and is now very interested. Waiting out back for Scott, Nelson sings, Get thee behind me, Satan, worried about temptation. Fred and Ginger accidentally enter the dance contest and perform a fun dance to Let Yourself Go. Of course they win. Fred just has to screw up. On his way out the door, he insults Ginger's boss, and she loses her job. He promises to get her in with the big producer tomorrow. Things are going great for Nelson until she mentions marriage, a phrase Scott is allergic to. Ginger's friend Alwyn stops by and then waits for Scott outside. Fred is stunned when he finds out the fleet is sailing immediately. The girls have had an unexpected wonderful day until they see the fleet sailing off. Not knowing she has already lost Scott, Nelson contracts to have the ship she inherited fixed up from an old family friend to make a life for her and Scott. Fred and his band put on an impromptu performance for the brass, singing and dancing to I'd Rather Lead a Band. This dance is highly regarded by professional dancers for Fred's ability to dance on the half-beat or off-beat. The fleet pulls back into port. Nelson is excited. Ginger is still mad. Nelson arranges a beautiful dinner for Scott, but when Ginger returns home, she finds Nelson sleeping, having been stood up. Fred sleeps in a phone booth, waiting for Ginger's call. Ginger does a great tap dance to Let Yourself Go for her audition, the first of only two times Ginger performs solo in their movies. Fred is outside trying to arrange an audition for Ginger, and when a drink of water is requested, he sabotages this other girl by putting bicarbonate of soda in the cup. Ginger tries to sing and walks off, humiliated. Fred brags to Ginger how he got rid of that other girl, and Ginger vows to get even with him. She dances with another man, glaring over at Fred. Then she tells Fred that man has been terribly crude to her, Fred fearlessly charges over, with Ginger smirking, and ends up in the pond. Fred realizes he was tricked into assaulting an officer, and Ginger asks if he needs some bicarbonate of soda. Jeez. Nelson is thrilled meeting Scott, but he blows her off. She sings the somber and fitting But Where Are You, expressing her sadness, a nice performance. She sees Scott with Alwyn, and hears he lied about being on duty the night before, and her heart is broken. Fred visits Ginger with a monkey and flowers. Ginger is still mad at him, but more worried about Nelson. Fred finds out Nelson is the girl Scott has been dodging. Nelson has to come up with 700 by Saturday, and Ginger assigns Fred the task. Fred puts together a fundraising show on the boat, with his Navy buddies and Ginger's friends. Ball gets her best line to date. Fred and Ginger do a very nice three-part scene here, too. I'm putting all my eggs in one basket. First, Fred again shows off his piano-playing skills. Then they take turns singing the song. Finally, they do a vaudeville-style comedy dance scene to the music. Fred cleverly sabotages Scott's relationship with Alwyn. The night of the show, and Fred is missing. Ginger is furious and said if he does not show, no more Fred. Fred's liberty is canceled because of Ginger's stunt. Fred will not let the girls down. He assaults an officer and goes AWOL diving off the side of the ship. My hero. The big producer comes to see the show. Scott is sent to arrest Fred. He talks with Nelson and realizes she is something special. She is too hurt and tells him it is too late. He goes to arrest Fred and learns the reason for the show, all Nelson has done for him. He lets Fred perform, 
Up to this point, it has been a decent movie. Some laughs, some nice song and dance routines. Now comes the highlight of the movie, an act in the show by Fred and Ginger to Let's Face the Music and Dance. This is their first somber romantic dance, and it is beautiful. In my opinion, it is these that separated the Fred and Ginger movies from the rest of the musicals of their time. In this case, Irving Berlin's song, Fred and Pan's choreography, Fred and Ginger's dancing, and their acting while dancing, creates a scene of overwhelming emotion and class. Well, it's a Fred and Ginger movie, happy ending required. Scott and Nelson are engaged and plan on sailing the seas together. The big producer offers Fred and Ginger a contract. Fred says only if Ginger will ask to marry him, which he does. The boys sail off to the ship and the brig, happy, as the sisters wave to their men. After Fred and Ginger's unexpected success in their first movie together, stealing the show and flying down to Rio, RKO knew they had a hit on their hands. After the shooting, Fred went to London to complete his final stage obligation, performing Gay Divorce on the West End. Producer Pandro S. Berman flew to London to see the show, and it became their second movie, The Gay Divorcee. This is a wonderful, charming movie. Their first movie is the leads nominated for Oscar Best Picture and winning the first Oscar Best Song for The Continental. Notice at the top of the poster, The King and Queen of the Carioca, their surprise hit dance from flying down to Rio. And, at least on this poster, Ginger had top billing for the last time. Fred did not want to do another movie with Ginger, for a variety of reasons, both valid and invalid, covered in detail in the Fred and Ginger documentary series. It's a good thing Berman refused, because together they would reach heights they rarely reached again. It started in earnest here. This first movie together set the pattern for many of their successful movies. Fred meets, falls for, and infuriates Ginger all in their first brief encounter. He chases after Ginger, getting nowhere until he sings to, and then dances with her, and she is enthralled. The dance, their first romantic ballroom dance, to Cole Porter's beautiful and popular Night and Day, is gorgeously choreographed and executed. A clever mistaken identity plotline is introduced, and Ginger is once again infuriated and Fred clueless. The character actors provide most of the comic relief, and Horton, Brady, Rhodes, and Bloor are great. At that time, very long song and dance scenes performed by a huge ensemble were common, but they outdid themselves with the longest ever at 17 and one-half minutes until 1951's An American in Paris 18-and-a-half-minute ballet scene. Fred and Ginger resolve the confusion, and Ginger sings the first Oscar Best Song winning, The Continental, and their part of the too-long dance scene is very nice. Of course, all is resolved in the end, and Fred and Ginger live happily ever after. The movie opens with Fred, a famous American dancer, and Horton, his lawyer pal, dining in a Parisian restaurant. They have both forgotten their wallets, so Fred has to dance for his dinner to Don't Let It Bother You. Arriving in England, Fred comes across Ginger with her dress caught in a locked trunk. He offers to help, fetch her aunt, but then says an incredibly stupid line. A third party might spoil this. Then he rips her dress, trying to free it. He lends her his overcoat, and she storms away, justifiably furious. His coat is returned in the mail, but no note from Ginger. Fred is determined to find her, and Horton says no problem. There are only three million women in London. Fred sings and dances to A Needle in a Haystack. Search he does, until he bumps his car into Ginger's. She takes off, and Fred chases, and finally traps Ginger's car. He offers her refreshments and marriage. Ginger is sarcastic, but hides how charmed she is Fred adores her so. But something is holding her back. In the next scene, we find out what it is. Brady brings Ginger to her lawyer, who, of course, 
regardless of the one in three million odds, is Horton. Ginger is married, never sees her husband, and wants a divorce. To force the issue, Horton arranges a phony tryst at a resort between Ginger and a hired co-respondent. After weeks of not hearing from Ginger, Fred agrees to go with Horton to the resort. Here there is a charming little number where 17-year-old Betty Grable does a song and dance routine with Horton to Let's Knock Knees. Talking with Horton, Fred uses a line from an act he was in, Chance is a fool's name for fate, which Horton loves. When arranging the tryst for Ginger, Horton shows off by making that quote the password. Fred sees Ginger and chases her again, down to an empty rotunda. He charms Ginger singing the beautiful Night and Day to her, and they dance their first of a long series of gorgeous ballroom dances to the song. Ginger sits there overwhelmed, and in this age of Hayes Code, Fred makes a sly reference, asking her if she wants a cigarette. Showing off, Fred uses the same quote, making Ginger believe he is the co-respondent. She arranges the tryst for midnight and furiously storms off. He doesn't have a clue, as became the norm. In her hotel room at midnight, Ginger is angry and defensive, leaving Fred befuddled. Brady comes in and tells Ginger another man, Rhodes, is mauling the quote downstairs. Ginger is now sweet, and Fred thinks she is nuts. Only when Rhodes enters the room do they resolve the confusion. Babysat by Rhodes, down on the dance floor, the Continental begins to play. Now begins the 17 and one half minute song and dance scene. Ginger is adorable singing this first Oscar best song to Fred. They sneak out onto the dance floor and do a lively dance, half ballroom, half jazzy. Now the ensemble pours out onto the floor, and this goes on for a while. The song is sung again, hilariously, by Rhodes, and then again by Lillian Miles. Fred and Ginger hit the floor again, going through some varied dance styles. It is all too long for my taste. Large ensemble dancing bores me to death, but Fred and Ginger are great. The next morning, Ginger's husband surprises them, and instead of being furious, he says he will forgive her and refuses a divorce. Then Bloor, the waiter, reveals him as a bigamist, and Fred and Ginger live happily ever after with a nice closing dance. Choosing the Barclays or Broadway as their fourth best movie will cause even more disagreement, but personally, I really love this movie. For Fred and Ginger, ten years had passed since their last movie together. The Barclays of Broadway was not planned. Fred had retired in 1946 after Blue Skies, but was talked into doing Easter Parade, a big hit. Barclays was to be his next pairing with Garland, but she had succumbed to her addictions, so Ginger got the call. Yet it seems made for them. I believe it was the highest grossing movie either of them would appear in until Towering Inferno 25 years later. I have studied Fred and Ginger's enormous careers and lives in detail. It was not always rosy, not always successful. What is so inspirational in their life stories is how they never quit, never stopped, and found ways to once again rise to the top, even in their golden years. This movie is one of those moments where they proved they still had it, put on one hell of a show, and ended their partnership as it should have been, on top. Hooray for Fred and Ginger. That's why I love this movie so. In the opening scene, Fred and Ginger do a nice little dance, swing trot, but it is almost completely covered over by the opening credits. Duh. They did pose for some nice photos of the scene. On the ride to the opening night party, we see they squabble a great deal. Starting off positive and lovey-dovey, Ginger anticipates Fred's perfectionist criticism, Fred delivers, and she loses her temper. Just like they really were. They make up at the party, but then a young French playwright and director tells Ginger exactly what she wants to hear, that she is a great dramatic actress wasted in musical comedy, the opposite of Fred's criticism. 
Ginger is enthralled by the idea and totally forgets Fred is waiting for her. When he confronts Ginger, he clearly sees what Ginger seems to be totally oblivious of. This creep is wooing his wife. Oscar Levant, a great pianist, plays a rousing rendition of the saber dance for the party. When they get home, Fred is seething with jealousy and insecurity. Ginger taunts him with the praise she received from the creep, and Fred blows his top and says things he does not mean until Ginger hits him in the head with a bottle. Again, they quickly make up, and Fred sings the sweet, You'd be hard to replace, to Ginger. In one of the two highlights of the movie, Fred and Ginger do one of their best fun dances in Bouncing the Blues. Fred and Ginger attend a half-baked artist's exhibit of his impression of them, and Ginger is aggravated by again being trilby to Fred Spengali. The creepy director is also there, and Fred is annoyed as Ginger is again flustered around him. For their show, they do a Scottish routine in kilts, my one and only Highland Fling. They go to a weekend getaway, and on the walk from the train sing Weekend in the Country with the reluctant Levant. Fred and Levant go golfing, and Ginger is supposed to meet them at the ninth hole. The creepy director uses the opportunity to enact his plan, telling Ginger only she could play the part of Sarah Bernhardt in his play. Ginger is totally mesmerized at the possibility, and again forgets all about Fred. When Fred appears, furious, the director hides, and Ginger pretends she is sick. Preparing for a magazine photo shoot in their house, Fred discovers Ginger is hiding the creep's script, and, worse, a note congratulating her on fooling Fred that she was sick at the getaway. Fred explodes and says terrible things, and Ginger walks out on him. Now on his own, Fred does a very creative dance with special effects, shoes with wings on. Ginger is doing terribly under the creep's direction. Fred watches her rehearsal, and when Levant cleverly manipulates Fred, Fred calls Ginger, pretending to be the creep, and gives her solid advice. It works, and Ginger's next rehearsal performance is great. Fred always modestly downplays his acting skills. Here, watching from the wings, he is fantastic, expressing such joy and pride in his wife. And then devastation, when she hugs the creep and calls him darling. Levant has been working at getting the two back together, telling each the other will not be at his yearly benefit show. We get to again see what a virtuoso pianist Levant is, with his rendition of Concerto in B-flat minor for piano. Ginger is aggravated when Fred joins her in the wings and puts on a great show of how she wants nothing to do with him. Fred knew she was going to be there, but blames Levant for fooling them both. Now comes the second highlight of the movie, the most touching ballroom dance scene they ever performed. They can't take that away from me. The only time they ever reused a song, in Ginger's bio she said it was wasted the last time, and I agree. Levant completes his plan by announcing they will dance together. About to dance with Fred again, what Ginger loves most in all the movies they made. Her facade is ripped away, and she looks so vulnerable. Fred pleads with his wife with the words of this beautiful song. They dance, and Ginger starts smiling, dancing with the man she loves. They stop, face to face, and Ginger is so torn. For the life of me, I do not understand why some dance critics dismiss this dance. To me, Fred's choreography was beautiful, and it was beautifully executed. More than that, the highest level of dance is to express emotions, and here these two tell an entire story of their love for each other in one dance. It does not get any better. Afterwards, Fred tries to talk to Ginger, but she says nothing can happen until she proves herself as an actress and walks away sobbing. Opening night, and Fred sneaks in late. Ginger performs Sarah Bernhardt's Audition, an unfairly much-criticized performance covered in its own video. Once again, Fred's performance is perfect, so proud of Ginger, but worried now that she is a great success, he has lost her forever. Afterwards, Fred tells Levant his concerns. 
Levant's callous date makes it worse by declaring the creep dreamy and how he and Ginger make a great couple. In her dressing room, all Ginger cares about is if Fred saw her performance. Did he send flowers or a telegram? The creep comes in and finally makes his move, asking Ginger to be his girl. She dodges the conversation for now. Desperate, Fred calls again, pretending to be the creep, and asks who she loves. Again, Ginger dodges, until the creep walks into the room while she is still on the phone. Ginger's characters always have a bit of a mean streak, and here she tortures Fred while also telling him she loves him. Fred thinks it is all over. Ginger ditches her opening night party and goes to their apartment to surprise him. Fred is angry, and Ginger has a little more fun at his expense, until she does an impersonation of Fred impersonating the creep, and they are once again in each other's arms. Fred suggests a serious play, but Ginger declares she is a song and dance girl after all. Fred sings Manhattan Downbeat to Ginger, and they dance, and then dance in their show together, as it should be. And this was the end for Fred and Ginger. Many will also disagree with this choice. Let me explain. In the third movie, Roberta, starring Irene Dunn, Fred and Ginger had second and third billing, and once again, like they did in Flying Down to Rio, they stole the show. This was the forgotten Fred and Ginger movie, because when their movies started appearing on television, Roberta was left out, not really seen for almost 40 years. In its time, though, it was a very popular movie, 10th highest revenue of the year. Even though their previous movie, The Gay Divorcee, was nominated for Oscar Best Picture and won the first Best Song, this gave them their first big-time exposure. As I explain in depth in the review of this movie, if you love a performance, you are eager to see their next movie, and I truly believe their great performance in Roberta helped launch Top Hat to success. In Roberta, Fred and Ginger were alternately hilarious, entertaining in their songs and dances, and warm, charming characters. Fred and Ginger sparkled in this movie, so much so they were given the closing scene, like they had in Flying Down to Rio. The public wanted more. But a movie has to be seen to be recognized, to reach the level of all-time great movies. Roberta never got the chance. It's still great. They introduce two new aspects of this oh-so-talented team. Fred plays I Won't Dance on what he calls his filthy piano, and it is great. Ginger had come up through vaudeville and Broadway as a singer-comedian. In the play, her role had been performed by the Polish actress Lida Roberti, and Ginger, always great at mimicry, copies that accent as a girl from Indiana posing as Polish royalty in her stage act, to hilarious effect. Fred and his band from Indiana travel to Paris to perform in a club and are fired right there on the dock. Fred's good friend Scott has come along and he takes the band to his aunt, the famous fashion designer Roberta. Scott meets Dunn and sparks fly between them immediately. Ginger enters the scene as a customer of Roberta's and one nasty bitch. She is viciously berating Dunn so Scott comes to Dunn's rescue and sends Ginger hilariously flying through the air twice. Ginger likes this big, strong, handsome man and starts flirting with him. Roberta realizes Ginger can get Fred's band work, so Scott tells them, in the courtyard below, to audition right there, and they do a comedic song and dance to Let's Begin. Ginger comes out on the balcony to see the band, and when Fred and Ginger's eyes meet, they are both startled. When Fred gets upstairs, he realizes Ginger is playing some kind of game and plays along, but also ribs her hilariously. Alone, they know each other. Ginger explains you need a title to croon in Paris. She promises to get Fred work if he will just keep her secret. Dunn sings Roberta to sleep. For me, at first, her soprano voice was a little startling. Nobody sings soprano anymore. Give it a chance. Some of her songs are quite beautiful, though they started off with the least of them in Russian Lullaby. 
Now comes the first of two three-part scenes where they stole the show. Ginger is hilarious with her nasty Polish countess act, singing I'll Be Hard to Handle, at times acting furious as she sings. Then we get to find out they grew up together in Indiana and have loved each other since then. Fred is charming in this scene, where Ginger alternates between sweet and feisty. They do one of the greatest fun dances to the song, some have said in one or the first take, and the spontaneity shines through. You can hear them laughing and giggling as they dance. Dunn sings Roberta to sleep again with the lovely yesterdays. Sweet Roberta passes away. Scott inherits the business, but does not want it, does not have the skills to run it anyway. Fred and Ginger have some fun at his expense, a cute scene. Dunn and Scott have a bit of a squabble, but then Dunn is so crazy about Scott, they end up being partners. Ginger takes way too much pleasure in torturing Fred, declaring, tall, handsome gentlemen with large bank accounts will be asking for my telephone number, and getting it. Scott finally asks Dunn for a date. Then Scott's ex-girl appears from overseas, and Dunn is devastated. The horrible snooty ex is played perfectly by Claire Dodd. Dot is shopping for a dress and treats Dunn terribly, so Fred, in a really charming scene, comes to Dunn's defense. Opening night for Fred's band, and he is relishing the trap he has set for Dot. He talked her into wearing a dress, Scott declared vulgar. Dunn tried to stop it, but Dot antagonized her till she went along. Scott blows up about the dress and breaks up with Dot. The second three-part section for Fred and Ginger starts with Fred displaying his incredible piano-playing skills with I Won't Dance. In a hilarious scene, Ginger dances back and forth in front of the band, wanting Fred to dance with her, and they sing I Won't Dance. Fred has had enough of her routine. Ginger smirks when Fred sings how she affects him and pouts when he sings he will not dance with her. I love Fred's line, For heaven rest us, I'm not asbestos. Ginger smirks in the background when her two Russian giants carry Fred out onto the dance floor, and he does an amazing tap dance to the song. Scott gets drunk. Dunn comes in with Varconi to great fanfare, and Scott thinks she's on a date with the prince. At a Russian gathering for the princess, Dunn sings the first part of the beautiful Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. Scott confronts Dunn for selling Dodd the dress, and things get nasty. Dunn resumes the song as Scott walks out of the event, and shows why she was nominated for Best Actress five times, with a touching performance, a tear in her eye, and a cry in her voice. Dunn has left Roberta's, but visits to chastise Scott about the mess he is making. Instead, she finds out Scott has left the company in Fred's oh-so-capable hands. Fred and a much better behaved Ginger team up to get Dunn to come back, with Ginger saying, What a pity, the famous Roberta's to go second rate. It works. They put on a musical fashion show, too long of a scene, but it does have Lucia Ball's first appearance on the screen. Dunn sings the beautiful Oscar-nominated best song, Lovely to Look At, nicely combined with the plot as Scott appears, and they share a warm smile. Ginger finally gets what she's been begging for, a chance to dance with Fred. First they sing a section of Lovely to Look At, and then do a beautiful ballroom dance to Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. Fred's plan worked. Ginger says, I guess I have to give in to you, accepting his previous marriage proposals. Dunn and Scott are also reunited, and they all lived happily ever after, as Fred and Ginger do one of their most rollicking fun dances to I Won't Dance to end the movie. I seriously considered taking the coward's way out and declaring a tie for first place between Top Hat and Swing Time, but I had to make a choice. Six months after Roberta, Fred and Ginger, with the release of Top Hat, reached a level of success rarely achieved, a masterpiece that at the time was critically acclaimed and a huge financial success, and in retrospect still regarded as one of the greatest musicals ever. The movie was the number two revenue in 1935,
because that year also had the great Mutiny on the Bounty, starring the King, Clark Gable, at the height of his career. Top Hat was nominated for Best Picture, and Fred's Cheek to Cheek was nominated Best Song. Two dances were nominated for Best Dance Direction, The Piccolino and Top Hat, White Tie, and Tails. And while they are great dances, I rate the gorgeous Cheek to Cheek the second greatest and the most beautiful dance scene ever. More importantly, the public loved this movie. Second highest gross revenue movie of the year, the most successful RKO movie of the entire era. Fred and Ginger were never more popular, with their previous movie, Roberta, also the 10th highest revenue movie of the year. The top moneymaker poll, started in 1912, was the opinion of the movie theater managers where the industry dealt directly with the public. Fred and Ginger reached fourth place. Oscar-nominated Cheek to Cheek was also hit on the radio, reaching number one on the Billboard Top 100. All five songs made the top ten. It is AFI, the American Film Institute's, 15th best musical ever. I believe it should be higher. Cheek to Cheek is AFI's 15th greatest song ever. Four of the five dance scenes are among the drive-in's top 100 movie dances. Ginger wrote they were told that during the opening at Radio City Music Hall, the audience applauded each of the numbers. That's something. I covered the statistical history of musicals in the full review of Top Hat, and I truly believe if it was not for these two, not for this great movie, the exclusive list of five musicals that won Oscar Best Picture and were the highest revenue movies of the year would be six, and Fred and Ginger would have their rightful statistical place atop movie musical history. You just don't get to pick your competition for the year. Part of what makes this movie great are the comedians, and Edward Everett Horton, the great Helen Broderick, Eric Rhodes, and Eric Bloor are hilarious. Fred is in England to put on a show produced by Horton. Fred sings the charming No Strings on Fancy Free, bragging about his bachelor life. Then he breaks out into a dance to the song, stomping away, and wakes up an angry ginger in the hotel room below. She confronts Fred, and there goes his Fancy Free days as he is struck by her beauty. In a very sweet scene, Fred plays Sandman, dancing to put Ginger back to sleep. When showering Ginger with flowers doesn't work, Fred changes places with the livery driver to take Ginger to her horseback riding, and she is furious, but also a little charmed. Ginger is trapped by a thunderstorm, and Fred takes advantage. He sings the sweet, Isn't this a lovely day to be caught in the rain, to Ginger, and then they do one of their funnest dances to the song. It worked. Ginger is a model for fashion designer Rhodes and ecstatically tells him how thrilled she is with Fred. Now, like in The Gay Divorcee, a mistaken identity plot twist becomes the basis for all the comedic situations the rest of the movie. Ginger is led to believe Fred is her friend Broderick's husband and is furious. There is no way all the comedic twists and turns can be explained in a summary where every single character is caught up in the confusion. Watch the movie or follow the playlist. It's great. As part of his show, Fred sings the great Top Hat White Tie and Tails and then does one of his most memorable solo dances to it. They all head down to Venice and to the most amazing Art Deco GWS Great White Set ever, taking up two studios. The insane, yet so very clever, script continues on. Poor Horton suffers the brunt of the misunderstandings, including his life being threatened twice by Rhodes, in defense of Ginger's honor, and Broderick gives him a black eye. Ginger and Broderick scheme against Fred, but he turns the tables on Ginger, and she is more upset than ever. Finally, with Horton in hiding from Rhodes, Fred, Ginger, and Broderick meet. Broderick is playing matchmaker. Fred loves it, but it is so bizarre to Ginger. The highlight of the movie is a very beautiful song and the most beautiful dance in movie history to Irving Berlin's Cheek to Cheek, and one famous or infamous 
unusual ostrich feather dress. Fred sings to Ginger in his very charming way, and she stares at him intently, letting all know Fred is mesmerizing. Then they dance, and the audience is mesmerized by this beautiful, dramatic, flowing scene. Ginger is overwhelmed with emotions after the dance, and actually considers being Fred's mistress until he asks her to marry him. After declaring she loves him, she slaps Fred in a fury and storms off. Poor Fred does not have a clue. Torn between her passion and her morality, Ginger agrees to marry Rhodes to escape the hold Fred has on her heart. Back to the zany plot, Fred, Horton, and Broderick finally resolve the confusion, and Fred gets Ginger alone to explain it to her. More zany plot. This threesome is adrift in the Adriatic Sea. Never mind trying to explain. Fred and Ginger take advantage of the time to enjoy dinner and dancing, leading up to the last of the large ensemble Busby Berkeley-style dance numbers in their movies, The Piccolino. Ginger is adorable singing the song. Then the two do a lively dance to it, also nominated for Oscar Best Dance Direction. Fred and Ginger confront Ginger's husband, Rhodes, but with another plot twist, it ends up they were never really married, and Fred and Ginger live happily ever after, doing a final quick dance. Swing Time was well recognized during its time, both professionally, winning the Oscar Best Song for The Way You Look Tonight, and nominated for Best Dance Direction for Bojangles of Harlem, and by the viewing public, the ninth highest grossing movie of 1936. Fred's radio versions of The Way You Look Tonight and A Fine Romance both hit number one on the Billboard Top 100. It has only become more highly regarded over time. AFI's number 90 Top 100 Movies, number 30 Top 100 Passions, and The Way You Look Tonight, number 43 Top 100 Songs. Without an official dance ranking, it has four dances in the Drive-In's Top 100 Movie Dances. The top moneymaker poll, started in 1912, was the opinion of the movie theater managers, where the industry dealt directly with the public. Fred and Ginger reached third place in 1936, the highest level either would ever reach, after placing fourth in 1935. Starting with their second movie, all were romantic comedies alternating between two plot lines. The gay divorcee introduced the main storyline. Fred meets Ginger, Fred immediately falls for Ginger, Fred infuriates Ginger, and Fred chases Ginger for the rest of the movie till he wins her heart. Roberta started the other pattern. Fred and Ginger are long-lost lovers reunited. Top Hat went back to Fred falling for Ginger at first sight, followed the fleet, reunited lovers. On pattern, in swing time, Fred falls for Ginger at first sight again, and for most of the movie, it stays true to form. Fred wins Ginger's heart over and over, only to justifiably infuriate her from her viewpoint, because he never tells her the truth. Fred is, as usual, haplessly but relentlessly chasing Ginger, and Broderick is his constant angel, explaining to Ginger what really happened. What is a little different this time is Ginger chases Fred a little, and is especially sweet in many of the scenes, forgiving Fred over and over, and then showering him with love. Then Fred screws up again. Most of the song and dances are seamlessly integrated into the plot. After infuriating Ginger by stealing her quarter, and then aggravating her even more by taking free dance lessons from Ginger at her job, pretending he is the worst case of two left feet ever, in the cute pick-yourself-up, Fred begs, Teacher, please teach me something. And Ginger softens, singing, Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, start all over again. Ginger finally explodes in frustration and loses her job. To save it, Fred does one of their most joyous fun dances with Ginger to pick yourself up, and not only saves Ginger's job, but gets her a dance at a big club, a dream come true for her. And on it joyfully continues. After again infuriating Ginger, Fred wins her heart by singing the most beautiful song in the series to her, The Way You Look Tonight. Fred's nickname is Lucky because of his amazing gambling luck. After a series of maneuvers, 
Fred wins the band's contract, and they finally get to do their dance, the highly rated Waltz and Swing Time, one of Ginger's favorites. Fred has gotten himself into a real mess. He is engaged to another woman, cannot break it off, cannot tell Ginger, and cannot lead Ginger on any further. She sweetly throws herself at Fred, and he keeps on ignoring her attempts. This leads to a very entertaining scene, another where the song is integrated so smoothly into the storyline, where Ginger furiously and humorously vents at Fred singing A Fine Romance. Broderick comes to Fred's rescue again, and a terrified Ginger tries to kiss Fred. Once he gets over the shock, they kiss, and both are thrilled. Fred does a dance scene as part of their show, the Oscar-nominated Bojangles of Harlem, and, yes, in blackface. This is discussed in the video on this dance. This is an homage to a great dancer, Bill Bojangles Robinson, who Fred befriended when he was a teen in vaudeville. This is Fred's first usage of special effects, dancing to three huge projected images. This is where the movie is different and rises above the rest. Everything falls apart for Fred, and this time it is not his fault. He is stunned to see his fiancée in the audience at the worst possible time. Moore idiotically shows off his card skills to the gangster, and Fred is given an offer he cannot refuse, and loses the band. Fred's fiancée comes into his dressing room, and a moment later Ginger comes in. In rapid order, Ginger learns that Fred has broken his promise to no longer gamble, because if he wins 25000 he has to marry his fiancée, and then that Fred's fiance is standing next to him. Devastated, Ginger runs out of the room and into Matox's arms and accepts his marriage proposal. In their previous movie, Follow the Fleet, Fred and Ginger had done their first somber, beautiful dance, Let's Face the Music and Dance. But it was disconnected from the storyline, a dance they did in a show. Here, it is fully integrated. Ginger is pitiful asking if Fred's fiancée dances beautifully, trying to understand why she was not good enough. Fred tells Ginger, after having danced with her, he will never dance again. Fred and Ginger proved they had a much wider acting range, because star-crossed lovers doomed to part ways is a sad event. Their acting leading up to, and including the never-gonna-dance scene, is so very touching, so very passionate why they got that number 30 AFI Top 100 Passions rating. Their acting was never finer. Fred sings the mournful Never Gonna Dance to Ginger, a broken man epitomized by the verse, Always Gonna Love You. The dance starts slowly to The Way You Look Tonight, the song that brought them together as they walk around the dance floor. Ginger leans her back into Fred and then walks away, only to be pulled back by a desperate Fred. Then they dance to Never Gonna Dance, their farewell song, and Ginger runs out of the room. Fred is bereft. Fred and Pan's choreography skills never shone brighter. Then it returns to a romantic comedy. Fred executes a series of maneuvers to repair the damage. Ah, the happy bride. Everyone is hysterical at the thought of Ginger actually marrying Metoxa, until Ginger joins in the laughter and they live happily ever after. Please like and subscribe.